And I want to speak this um, afternoon from, from some of the energy of that conference. And uh, let us honor what God is doing. Let's be humble. Because uh, in these latter days, I was just reading a book by a, uh, quite a, 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 a scroll from, from Mega Church to Multiplication, an American pastor who was pastoring a church of over 5,000 people. I said five or even 10,000. But in this time, he says uh, the, the, the key lessons uh, God is challenging them to imply, uh, to, to apply. Uh, actually, they are learning from churches in Africa. Yeah. And it includes extended prayer. Intense faith. Crazy, crazy worship. <laughs> and they were formerly a very contained little church where everything is, is, is nice. But God told them, you're not doing enough. You're going to destroy America with your little comfortable congregations. You need to stretch out. And see what I'm doing in the nations of the world. So statistics have shown that um, if America continues how it's going, they have done their statistics. So I can't quote any British figures. But if they continue what they are doing, they will destroy the nation. That the churches there will destroy the nation. And this was a, a church which is effective. Thousands of people. Big budget. Multiple sites. God is saying what you're doing is not enough. You are not winning enough people to the Lord and the population growth is outstripping the evangelism rate. Do you understand? The rate at which people are coming to Christ does not scratch the surface compared to the population growth. So we need to continually believe for something amazing to happen in our days. Amen? The proportion of believers in the world are critical in maintaining the balance of righteousness in the nations. We are the salt of the earth. Yeah. The real, realistic truth is that if you took away the influence and the conscience that the church brings into community, everything would top over, would tip over and go a totally different direction. So, please, please understand that we must continue as LCF to press in into the changes that God is, is birthing here at LCF through following other movements. Recently, a pastor approached me and said, Pastor, I'm very concerned. You keep talking worship harvest. What, what about liberty? I said, liberty is liberty. And I should be talking about Azusa Street. And I shall be talking about Catherine Kuhlman. I should be talking about... Uh, uh, McPhee Simpson. Simpson, these are the guys that have given us the roots of where we are. But now, in this season, uh, we're looking at mission or discipleship, which is a global movement. But we are tipping, connecting in especially, into that global movement through imitating the life and ministry of a church that uh, every, everybody is talking about currently in the world. is Worship Harvest Church. Very important principles. To learn. God has visited a place we bless it and we humble ourselves. Amen. So uh, something struck me this conference and I came back with it. <laughs> I'm constantly ripping my, my clothes and you know in that Jewish kind of way when they were distressed they would tear their clothes <laughs> which was a way of saying this is not enough. When they are so distressed, they will rip their clothes. And uh, so we are theming multiplication. Interestingly, I mean, our theme is multiply. Guess what the theme of the conference was? Multiply. <laughs> that was the theme of the conference. And I was blessed to, to tune back and, and listen to Pastor Grace preaching on multiplication, the uh, uh, nesting places. Uh, can we turn to Exodus 1? Verse 8 to 19. Let me get into this uh, text and then I will tell you my subject and what I'm wrestling with right now as I, 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 I have um, been putting on new garments. Um, 
Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come. Let us deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply. You know, the agenda of the devil is to keep you contained. He doesn't want you, us, to multiply. Now remember the commission of man in the Genesis is be fruitful. Number one, two, multiply. Number three, fill the earth and subdue it. Somebody was saying, actually, those are four stages of growth. That initially, you need to unlock your capacity to produce fruit. Once you do that, then you move into multiplication. And the purpose of multiplication is not just to have numbers, but that those numbers should be a tool to fill and bring dominion into spaces. There are four stages there. It's possible to just remain fruitful. But God wants you to do, do, have dominion. And dominion cannot really function off one soul. There's got to be a multiplication of fruitfulness. Yeah? And then a filling of these fruitful people into more spaces so that dominion may come. So when we say that your kingdom come, we're not talking about our refrigerators and our parking lots, and our homes. We're talking about God doing something that touches our neighborhoods, that touches our extended family. It's got to be multiplication and dominion. Do you, do you follow that? But you see, if Satan blocks stage two, he's blocked everything. So the point here, uh, in stopping the... Um, the increase of Israel is make sure they do not multiply. Make sure they don't multiply. And you can look so nice. You see, imagine how many of you have ever enjoyed a bottle of Coca-Cola? I know it's not too healthy. I'm probably choosing the wrong drink here for this healthy Imagine, imagine whoever created that did not multiply it. They drank it and says, wow, that was fruitful. <laughs> but they did not multiply it. At a loss. Beauty must be multiplied. Resourcefulness must be multiplied. More people must be part of it. There's nothing as sad as going to a holiday alone. Have you ever been to a holiday alone? <laughs> it's not a holiday. You look at all these amazing things and you're alone. There's no one to say, did you see that? Every time I'm away on a holiday or see a good place, in my head I'm thinking, I need to bring people here. I wish I could fly everybody here so they can experience this. Multiplication must follow. Multiplication is an essential part of what has to happen. But you see, Satan's agenda is make sure multiplication does not happen. And it says, in the event of war, they also may join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore, how do we stop multiplication? He set taskmasters over them. To afflict them with their burdens. That they build for Pharaoh supply cities. Pithom and Ramses. Yeah? Make sure they are overwhelmed with weights. And disturbances and burdens and conflicts. That their capacity to multiply is destroyed. Do you understand the agenda here? And so, how to kill multiplication overburden the person? Destroy them with issues. <laughs> now, Tanya, I'd ask your neighbor, what are your issues? 
Olha aí. Eu... <risos> Some of us are so busy locked down by issues. And, and what I found about life, issues never stop. Problems never stop. There are always gaps. There are always scenarios and situations and, and distractions and stupid people and messy places. And <laughs> you cannot wait and say, the day I be, everything becomes nice, I'll start multiplying. No, we. We need to understand the principle. Verse 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. In fact, trouble, obstacles are the very reasons I will multiply. Do you understand? We need to switch that, that, that the very thing Satan devised by Pharaoh to stop them multiplying became a catalyst for their multiplication. You need to install something in your mindset that whatever goes on in your life, you will multiply, regardless. In fact, the harder the obstacles, the more you will multiply. The more opposed you are, the more you will push forward. It's a decision you make. I determine to be unstoppable, undeterred, against all odds. This is a, 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 a dynamic that was within Israel. The more you oppressed them, the more they multiplied. And they were in the dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made plan B. As then the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and all manner of service in the field, and all the, their service in which they made them serve with rigor. Then the king of Egypt's plan B, spoke to the midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the other poor, and he said, when you do the duties of midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the bath stools, if it is a son that you, sh then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then you shall let them live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male alive? And the wives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. <laughs> for they are lively. And give birth before the midwives come to them. <laughs> Amen. Before the devil knows it's finished. <laughs> Before the devil can hatch up a flan, I'm done. I want to, I picked up a word here. So I entitled my, my message, Multiplication. The birth stool. The birth stool. And I want you to see what a birth stool looks like. So, uh, Pharaoh said, when you see them on the birth stools, when you see them on the birth stools, there <laughs> are things you pass quick. I want you to notice the birth stool. There are no cushions. Actually, <laughs> exactly there, the lessons are jumping out already. Multiplication inevitably includes the birth stool. And as an individual, as a community, we need to understand if we are to experience multiplication, we need to engage the birth stool. 
And as you can see it, some of you are shocked because you, you pass it usually. You see them on the bath stool. What does that look like? I had to go online and say, what does the bath stool look like? This is actually a modern bath stool. When you go to the Egyptian bath stools, there were two stones. The word, the word translated bath stool simply means two stones. And so, a, a, I mean, these days in the labor world, there's fancy ways that they prop you up and you're on a bed. And, but definitely the Egyptian way to birth and a lot of cultures in those days, two stones. One to support that thigh and the other to support that thigh. And that's it. And the baby has to be birthed and caught in that setting. No cushions. You have to push to get this life out. And while you're pushing, somebody is trying to come and kill them. That was the edict. Kill them. Kill the boys. So God was speaking to my heart about the birth stool because when I came back from, from Uganda, I just, I just had the sense of, God, we need to birth something here. Can I talk about birth a little as someone who has given birth <laughs> twice over? <laughs> I was there in the labor wood. Hey, hey, serious. I know how this goes down. <laughs> oh, these are mysterious things. But you see, God, God uses the pictures of the earth. Because God was showing me, you will never multiply if you shun the birth stool. And I'm not talking about literal birth stools here. I don't, you may not have say, a, a physical pregnancy, but everybody here has got to multiply. And multiplication takes you to a birth stool. There are no cushions. It's raw and rugged. And you must push until something happens. Progress comes by force. And you wish babies could just grow, particularly human babies. You wish you could lay an egg and leave it at home <laughs> at a certain temperature and continue with your career. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Connie, don't you wish you had laid eggs of all these children you've had? The birth stool. Yeah, isn't it amazing that the most complex organism in the world has, did not evolve a convenient way to birth? In fact, animals and birds beget children easier than man. The most evolved, call it biologically, the most evolved being carries the pregnancy for nine months. It distends you makes your nose the size of the earth. It adds, you struggle with weight, your bones come out of joint, you walk weird, your appetite changes, you vomit, you do all kinds of madness. And you think, why is it not convenient? You see, God spoke to the woman after the fall in the garden, I will greatly multiply. Now, after, 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 and I don't, don't, I won't, don't want to get stuck on this. I just want you to understand that there is pain to progress. That's my agenda today. All progress hurts. All progress needs this word called labor. And the pushing of a child out is called labor. And, and a woman must labor. And the labor really does not start in the labor ward. It starts with the conception. And how 
a woman's body begins to adjust and battle through the hormonal changes because now there is a child to carry and everything must be realigned and so your appetite changes there's all kinds of scenarios my my late sister god bless her every time she became pregnant there was a crisis crisis as her body contends to preserve this life and sustain it for nine months and god said to Eve, I will greatly multiply your sorrow. We don't understand exactly why. But when man fell, things changed. Now, in this realm. Yeah? Are you with me? In this realm, in this chapter of life, there are no convenient ways to give birth. Yeah. Since we fell... Since sin came into the world, and it is a picture, all this is a picture of the reality about life. Everything requires effort and sacrifice and discipline before multiplication can happen. And I'm saying that because I've come away from a conference where a church has grown from 4,500 people to 27 thousand people in a few years or two two and a half three years they have multiplied by how many times is that good mathematicians help me from four and a half thousand to twenty seven thousand hmm? seven times I don't know whether you guys passed maths I'm suspecting that answer very <laughs> what do you do when thousands of people show up at your doorstep in the COVID period of lockdown they grew from 4,500 to 12,000 people will be within less than a year and it hurts it hurts to grow it hurts to multiply when I say hurts, I'm not talking about the pain of a hand. I'm talking about the, the changes, the price, the sleepless nights, the labor <laughs> that is involved. But it's a type of this declaration to Eve. God speaks to her, but in speaking to Eve, God is speaking to anyone who will incubate anything. Anyone who will birth anything. Because all of us, I mean, besides the human physical sexes, we're talking about the capacity to incubate, which is a, a maternal language. And all of us are pregnant with something. Dreams. Hopes. You're pregnant. You better be pregnant. You better be carrying something inside your heart that you want to see manifested. And so when God is speaking to Eve, he's speaking to Lincoln, he's speaking to Connie, he's speaking to Flavia, he's saying, in sorrow, in great sorrow, you shall multiply. Uh, that's the, 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 keep that verse up there. Oh, did I even give it to you? What was it? When God says, I will, greatly, I will greatly multiply your sorrow or your pain. The actual word there uh, translated sorrow. This way. While I was in Uganda, I realized running Worship Harvest Church is difficult. There were 6,000 people to feed every lunch. 6,000 people. And they had to be sectioned and food had to be served. And I tell you, friends, can I talk? Can I talk freely? It hits you from afar. From the time, and you drive through the humble streets of when you turn off the main road at Nalia. And you, you know, it's amazing when you go to, to, to my mother country and God help us. What's that sound? Oh, okay, the blinds are going. Okay, that's fine. So, I mean, the roads are so broken currently, and there's so much dust and so 
such crazy stuff. When you're driving to worship harvest, Nalia, you drive through this very weird little street with crazy dirty places, and then you turn left and you are suddenly at worship harvest. And everything changes. And you see multiplication and its impact. <laughs> when an, a family, a church family, a group, a community hosts multiplication and goes to the birth stool and labors to see something above the ordinary. And suddenly there's civilization. And they spot you and there are people on the road and you are marked out and they, are, they have lanyards and labels and everything is click, clock, click, clock. And there are people holding signs saying, welcome! The worship harvest way. Welcome! And they're, yeah! They are all excited. Come, welcome to church. And it's like, whoa! I've suddenly moved out of dust and poverty and potholes. And I've entered the compound where multiplication is a culture and a mindset. People who have refused to be contained by the backwardness of the poverty that bothers the whole world, the, the, the whole community. And my God, the building, Worship Harvest building, when you look at it, it's like, how did this land in this <laughs> neighborhood and the structures of, of security and, and how you're ushered and people running ahead of your car to get you parking. You know, me, I, when, when I arrive, I arrive like a dignitary. So I get the chance of, of going past barriers and then we, we, we go through and to the back and there's a designated car park and somebody saying back up. And then my bags are carried and I'm wafted up and, and up the steps and Pastor Lincoln, Pastor, and people are getting out of my way and everything is streamlined. There are volunteers everywhere, the security people everywhere. There is protocol. And at this point, when, you, when multiplication comes to that point, security becomes essential. Guys are on walkie-talkies. He's here, he's here, we've got him. And guys are, are like this. Checking the environment. <laughs> then I come back home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, my days. What's the time? But you see, in me, I'm just harvesting benefits. I'm walking on concrete floors, and, and then you enter the auditorium, and it's like, am I in London? State-of-the-art technology, LCD displays. Thousands and thousands spent on systems that are... When I went to their media department, their, our desk, their desk runs from that wall up to probably where Mr. Kanyanya and Mrs. Kanyanya, all of it is media. I'm talking about MacBook, 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 MacBooks. When we bought our MacBooks, we, we raised the money until we felt <laughs> like we are going to die. <laughs> These machines cost a lot of money. Those guys had lines of MacBooks. And I'm thinking, my God, I'm in Africa. I'm in a country called Uganda whose debt is trillions of pounds. And corruption is in the air. You can smell it. <laughs> and you find a systematized place. Systematized. Everything, clockwork, clockwork. And when they are testifying, some of you probably followed this online, it's saying what they do. Yeah? And the departmental sections in media and technology. <laughs> I thought, wow. But you see, it's so easy to just reap the harvest. But the pain and the work, the labor, 
of sitting on the birth stool of multiplication and pushing things into being. Pushing things into being. God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow. Meaning there was some level of sorrow and pain even before the fall. God is saying this thing is going to go higher. And I'm taking responsibility for it because I can stop it. God is saying to Eve, I could have stopped it, but I'm not going to stop it. I'm going to allow it to hit you because you now stepped into an environment which is going to fight you. I want to kill your children. But he says to her, in pain you shall bring forth children. In pain you shall bring forth children. Tell your neighbor for me in pain. And some of you realize that it's painful to, to start a course. Painful to do an exam. Painful to stay in shape. My God, I look at Irene come here. Because she posts. And you see, pushing through the pain and making it productive. Huh? Pushing through the pain and inverting it to multiplication. My God. You see people in the gym and they're smiling. I say, how can you smile? <laughs> in the gym. <laughs> Pressing through the pain of a marriage to make it fruitful instead of running away. Pressing through the pain of a degree. Pressing through the pain of learning to drive. <laughs> hey. Huh? Ask your neighbor, when did you last get pain about something fruitful? Something fruitful. Some of us are pain dodgers. You cannot dodge pain and multiply. I'm not talking about morbid negative pain. I'm talking about the the discipline, the sacrifice, the focus, the sleepless nights, the short nights. It's the bath stool. Somebody say bath stool. Show them the bath stool again, Marvin. Keep it up there, actually. Whenever you finish, you put it back. I want them to see the bath stool. You need to understand God wants you to sit on that thing. And to push things out. Push that business out. Liberty has got to sit on the bath stool and bath a multiplying church. You've got to sit on the bath stool and make your MC work. You've got to sit on the bath stool and raise those kids. <laughs> so I was telling you about her experience in the world. I mean, Jerome, Jerome's birth. Is what went right through because Marvin, Marvin came by C-section. But I watched this woman called my wife experience the pain of childbirth. And I saw some quotations online. I said, what does it feel like? You see, a man was put on, was the simulation of labor pains were put on a man. Did you guys? <laughs> I remember seeing a video and you were saying, ah, 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 no, no. They were, they were just simulating the pain of childbirth. <laughs> and you were saying, no, no, no. Uh, women, this is what women said about childbirth. I had excruciating pain. Another one said the pain was all encompassing. Another one said, I felt like I was being run over by a train. Another one said, I begged my husband to throw me out of the car on the way to the hospital. <laughs> now, not to frighten ladies who are going to give birth to children. <laughs> not to frighten you. The truth is... <laughs> Some women hardly feel much pain. Some just say it felt like menstrual cramps, a little multiplied, but yeah, been there, done that. But the truth is, it hurts. And my wife has a high pain threshold. I watched her face. 
And I knew this woman is tough. So I just sat there and I provided my hand for torture. Because she just needed to squeeze something which was alive. To transfer some of our frictions. <laughs> but at a certain point, the pain rose excruciatingly. And I remember her saying, if it gets worse than this, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and I just didn't know what was going to happen next. Because I felt like she was wanting to do this without any assistance, none of this gas and the air. She was saying, I'm going to do this. But it got to a point where she just was not... And so, and then you see the nurses, she suddenly announced, at this point they were saying, you know, no, no, because the baby was in distress, baby is in distress, baby is in distress, we've got to, we can't continue, because we've got to take her to, to, to C-section. Then she said, I want to push, I feel like pushing. And they said, what? Because she was not, as they call it, daily. Now, the baby... I don't even understand. Have you seen the size of the uterus? In pictures. It's a tiny little structure. Yet on this assignment, once the uterus receives the blessing of a zygote and it implants, it remobilizes itself huh? And becomes the most incredible structure. You wonder how women carry twins. Is there any Nalongo here? Anyone who begat twins? Triplets. Quadruplets. And you think, how? Huh? You look at these women carry, and the structure, the structure was this small before. Now it is carrying a baby. And it is stretched to the limit. I'm talking about multiplication. You have to be stretched to multiply. You've got to change. It's you, but you are not you anymore. Because something more important than comfort and convenience has to be done. Oh, let's put our hands together for the girls, particularly those that have begotten some, some children into the earth. Hey! Hey! Dorothy! Hey, you begot that girl right over there. Huh? And the forces that this little uterus now mobilizes on the day of birth to push this child out. Hmm? And the pain and the contention. When you are in a labor ward, you feel so illegitimate. Typically, you are surrounded by women. A very female process is going on. And you are somehow there. <laughs> and I was completely blown away. I left the labor ward. I said, women, I salute because when my wife announced I feel like pushing, the nurse said, how, how? You can't push. You are just simani two centimeters. Then they checked and said, oh my God, she's fully. She is fully. Fully dilated. And the pain that she had felt and announced, I said, I can't do it. It's because now was the point. Now was the moment to push at the highest of the pain. Yeah, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but God is calling us to move away from being pain averse and trying to find the cheapest, most convenient way in everything we do. I stand, I stood and looked at the cathedral in Nalia. Oh my goodness, and they've built seven of them. They've built seven cathedrals. They are still constructing. And then they've built 15 smaller ones. 
but the sweat, the labor, the push. Their conferences start at 7 a.m. A.m. <laughs> and they push through up to 4. And I looked at the painstaking detail and was so proud that Africans are creating such an amazing show. An amazing conference. World-class deliveries. World-class media. But there is suffering. You see how much Michael is suffering? <laughs> A while ago he was there, then he was there, and then it's pain. Josh has been standing there like a statue. <laughs> and then you go online and four people are watching. But you have to suffer as if you are broadcasting to millions. You understand? I need to begin to bring this home. But you see, my wife suddenly said, when, when they said push, the whole countenance changed. Her whole countenance changed. And suddenly I, I saw womanhood. That's how I've always shared, when I've shared this story. That's when I look, I saw womanhood because suddenly it ceased to be a pain issue. It became about motherhood. My baby is coming and I'm pushing them out. And suddenly there was focus. Something more important than pain is going on. Tell your neighbor, there are more important things than pain and sacrifice and trouble. Isaiah 66 verse 8. Who has had such a thing? Who has seen such things? Did you get that Marvin? 66 8. Who has had such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed. Now the New King James says was in labor. She gave birth to her children. When she engaged the labor, the children arrived. When you engage sleep, they disappear. When you engage laziness and confusion, I'm confused. <laughs> you must enter labor to be rewarded with children. You must enter that laborous spirit. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. It's the laborers who are few. And I, I just face the reality is, I mean, this morning we were blessed listening to Andrew Tamale telling us that most of the world's wealth is in the hands of 3% of the, of the global population. you see guys, it's good to want to spend money, but to gather it, you have to labor. You've got to find something about labor. When Israel travel, when Zion travailed, she gave birth to her young. I came back with the declaration over this house, the spirit of laziness has to die The spirit of laziness has to die. Now ask your neighbor, if we put you on a lazometer, <laughs> what would your score be? If there's such a thing, if there was <laughs> something that measures laziness. Because according to the scriptures, until you travail, there is no deliverance. There's no multiplication. 
And the devil is a liar because in a realm of travail, some of us are still persuaded on doing little and at our leisurely pace. And so your whole life becomes chaotic because you are avowed to laziness and a very laid back mindset. Everything is there. Uh, uh. Laziness cannot create greatness. That's what I came back, back with <laughs> from Kampala. Laziness cannot create greatness. Cannot benefit. Cannot see multiplication. And every one of us needs to multiply career-wise, financially, emotionally, relationally. You cannot drag your feet and get results. Proverbs 14.4, and I'm closing. Proverbs 14.4, where no oxen are, the Bible says, the trough is empty. Oxen, oxen symbolize hard work in the Bible. Because they were the beasts of burden. They were the they were the energy providers of these rudimentary communities. Now where we flick a switch to provide power, they would get an ox to plow, to, to, to run mills. They just yoke an oxen. And the oxen pulls and draws and treads. And, and the Bible is saying without that, the trough is empty. But much increase comes from the strength of an ox. Liberty, we need to work so hard this year as a church, as an individual. Somebody shout hard work. Hey, say it like you believe it. Hard work! Yeah. Now, allow me to share. Now, this I would have even kept all camera. But you see, I, I pulled one of uh, the worship harvest people aside. And I asked them, I told them, tell me what makes this church work. C can I whisper into your ear? What runs a 27,115 branches of churches? God knows how many thousand missional communities. What makes them work? Listen to what they told me. Started from the top. Are you listening? He said to me, Our pastor is the most driven person I know. Driven. I hope he doesn't watch this and said to me, My pastor is the most driven person I know. He said to me, He wakes up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. To start his day. I'm telling you. By 10 a.m. His day's work is done. By 10 a.m. His desk is empty. So he said to me. He actually works two days. In one day. Because he clears the day's work. And then creates new work. To finish the day. He said, he's now still just describing his past. He, says, he has clear purpose and clear goals. And they're always in front of him. He doesn't, you know, you can go through life randomly and say, ha, you wake up and say, mm -hmm, what's the plan? What's up? What's up? And you, you, you text all your friends, what's up, 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 to give you a program for the day. What shall we do? What shall we do? Huh? huh? What are you doing today? <laughs> There's a clear purpose and clear goals. Yes, his diary is themed. Monday is this is what I do. Tuesday, this is what I do. Wednesday, everything is structured, labeled, timed. Are you still there? He says, at worship harvest, there's no tolerance for time wasting. 
there is no tolerance for time wasting. They don't like people who are like, huh? <laughs> no tolerance for time wasting. Everything must click, clock, click, clock, click, clock. No tolerance for time wasting. He says, Pastor, here we run a high speed culture. High speed culture. He said, things happen at the speed of thought. This is his word. Things are done at the speed of thought. Once you think it, you act it out. If it's worth any thought. So there's not, hey, let's think about it. Can we gather again next week? No, no, no. If it is worth its salt, we action it immediately. <laughs> Things are done at the speed of thought. He said, WhatsApp communications are answered in five minutes. This is the culture of the leadership team. When a text goes up, out from apostle's desk, in five minutes you must have answered. If you are part of the staff team. It's not this thing of checking WhatsApp. Have they replied? Have they even read it? It is still gray. It is gray. Monday, Tuesday. Then around Wednesday it goes blue. And you think, hey, hallelujah. They finally read their WhatsApp. And then there's no reply. Thursday, Friday. Then around Saturday at midnight, ping! <laughs> Can I talk? <laughs> this young man told me, if you can't, re they said we agreed as a church, WhatsApp is our main form of communication. And the response time is five minutes. If you are part of the, of, of the, of the staff team. This is a business of, uh, I don't know when, <laughs> where to find the message. Five minutes. I, I'm finishing. He said, it is white hot at the center. You know why you say red hot? After red hot, you go to white hot. He said, we are at white hot here in the core. And then that heat is spread outwards. You, have you had, we've used the term here of a red hot center. They run a white hot center. Everything is like hot. <laughs> and you noticed it. My God, you, you guys, I wish I could fly you out. All of you. White hot. Innovations and changes are quickly implemented and thoroughly monitored. <laughs> I'm just thinking, my God, this is a culture. Now, they didn't say it happened overnight. It has been systematically installed. Now, this year, we began to talk about systemization of LCF. And that journey continues. I'm going to ask you to please work with us. Because we are going to narrow things and increase the temperature gradually until it is white hot here at LCF. White hot. God will help us because that is what we are seeing. All these churches that are experiencing revival run the same culture. It's a culture of hard work. It's a culture of the birth stool. I'm finishing. I won't go into all these things. The other thing he says, there is no tolerance of complacency. As it was in the beginning, so it is now. World without end. Amen. Not at worship service. <laughs> no complacency. And he said to me, finally, there's a commitment by all to goals and performance. See, when I walked away from that scenario, I just, I just, the only way I could look at it, the, the word that came to me is the birth stool. You see, when you are a woman who, whose time has come to give birth and you sit on the birth stool, 
You can say, I'm tired. Me, I, I'm out. I, I don't want this. <laughs> I want out. I didn't bargain for this. <laughs> God is calling us, friends. Please stand to your feet. To sit on the birth stool. But you see, it can't, it can't just be here. It's got to proliferate and permeate into our homes, into my career life, into your career life, into your family life. It's, it's going to be progressive. But we've got to say yes, because what we want is multiplication. As I close, my challenge to you God's people is God is calling us to work harder than ever before in every area of our lives and to cast off a spirit of convenience, complacency, sluggardness, laziness, cast off discouragement and put on strength. Every eye closed as I close, I want to lead somebody to Christ. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice and you have never given your life to Christ, I want to lead you in a sinner's prayer. We want to make this a culture here at LCF. Somebody may be watching online and you have never given your life to Christ or you've fallen away from God. God is calling you back. There is so much work he wants you to do. And he expects you to be fruitful to multiply, to fill the earth and to have dominion. So say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I put away lazy ways and I ask you to change me. And for those that are praying this prayer the first time, ask him, write my name in the book of life. Change me. Transform me. I declare you today, Lord of my life, and ask you to change and transform me for your goodness. In Jesus' name. Everybody else lifting up your hand. Say after me, Lord Jesus, from today, I will sit on the birth stool and push things into being. I will push what must be pushed. I will manifest what must be manifested. I say yes to discipline. I say yes to hard work. I say yes to fruitfulness. I say yes to multiplication. I thank you God for the things you want to do in my life. And I say yes to that commitment. And God's people say, Amen.